Grab your seat and open with me to Acts chapter 15, taking a, a break from the Gospel of Mark for one week. We're going to look at an important concept. It's actually, if you've been to Starting Point, our membership class in the last year, year and a half, I don't remember when we made this change, we started this idea as part of our membership class. So if you went like last week, this is going to be very fresh for you. to starting point while we were including that content. And so I want us all to understand this because I think it's incredibly important for our church and for how we can maintain unity. We are in a good spot when it comes to unity right now, um, but this could be a concept that would help us to prevent a future disunity. So let's, let's do a little bit of prevention instead of correction later, if that makes sense. So Acts chapter 15 um, I'm curious if there's anybody in the room that uh, would still consider themselves newlyweds. Anybody? By the raise of hand. I don't know. Is that is that typically a year? Oh, okay. Uh, I think you're being a little generous there, perhaps, with the, the categorization. But, well, I've got some <clears throat> wisdom here for you for, for marriage. Maybe you're not a newlywed and you still haven't learned this yet. I, I still haven't learned it perfectly, but... One of the things when it comes to being wise as you go through your relationship is knowing when to fight and when not to fight. When is it worth it and when is it not worth it? Um, <clears throat> Meg and I had the opportunity to learn this lesson very quickly. Our first fight after being married was during our honeymoon, uh, like maybe two or three days in, and it was over how to uh, properly use a cheese grater. In hindsight, this was probably not worth the fight. I do think that I was right, <laughs> but somehow I still lost the argument. Um, so we need to learn when to fight and when not to fight, not just in our marriages, but also in the church. There are times when it is good and right and biblical to defend the gospel. In, in the book of Jude, we are told to contend for the faith. In 1 John 4, we are told to test the spirits because there are many false prophets. We see similar concepts in 2 Corinthians 11, Galatians 1, 2 Peter 2. There are times when a fight is necessary for defending the doctrinal fidelity of a church, for defending the, the truth and the gospel. But then there are times when the church has divided and for reasons that are not biblical, reasons that are unnecessary, reasons that hurt, honestly, our witness in the community. <clears throat> uh, my aunt recently told me about how the church that she's been going to for years and years and years just had a split because they moved the piano from that side of the stage to that side of the stage. And I'm, not, I'm not joking. I'm not I mean, maybe there was more going on behind the scenes than that, but literally, there was a large group of people that left the church because the piano changed sides of the stage. And so surely we would look at that and say, there are times when it's not worth the fight. There are times when our division is actually hurting our ability to proclaim the gospel in our community. And so, how do we know when? And that's what the concept we're going to learn this morning will help us to make those decisions. And we can see this in the, uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 31. It's a long passage, but there's, it's a pretty straightforward passage. We're not going to have to do a lot of digging or explaining to understand what it says. So <clears throat> here we go. Um, well, first, let me tell you what just happened. Paul and Barnabas have just returned back to Antioch, which was kind of their home base, from being on a church planting trip. They were going from city to city to city, creating churches, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel, creating churches. That's what they were doing. They come back home to report in and to say, hey, things are going well. And what they're going to do immediately after this passage is go back out and do that again, back out on another church planting trip. Um, and so they've come home to Antioch. And this happened, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So essentially we have these Jewish background Christians who are teaching that yes, Jesus is the Messiah, you are saved through faith in Jesus, but also you need to follow the laws and the customs of the Old Testament. This is Jesus and something else. 
Meaning, yeah, Jesus saves you, but you also, uh, in order to be saved, you have these other requirements. Verse 2, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, meaning they did not agree, they're saying this is compromising the gospel, what you're teaching is contrary to the gospel, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So what we see here is that they are going to rely on apostolic authority in order to find a final judgment and decision on this. Um, And really, apostolic authority, those who had uh, personally known Jesus and who had witnessed his resurrection, had been taught by Jesus, these were the ones who established the doctrine of the church. And and apostolic authority is primarily how most of the New Testament exists because those documents are tied to an apostle. And so, they're going to go to them for the decision. Verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So they're sharing with other Christians along the way all that God is doing in and through their mission. When they came to Jerusalem, verse 4, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But, verse 5, some believers... So again, these are Christians who have a Jewish background, but they're confused about the gospel. Some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the laws of Moses. <clears throat> so we're going to, the rest of this passage is called the Jerusalem Council, and this is the decision that the apostles passed down on this decision, but on this issue, but What we can see even before we get to the decision and understanding it is that something has already happened. Paul and Barnabas, if they had not been delayed by this dissension and this contention, where would they be right now? Back out in the world sharing the gospel and planting churches. So I'm not saying that this issue is unimportant. It is critically important. But if nothing else, we can first recognize that church disagreement can be an unfortunate distraction from the gospel, which is our first point this morning. Church disagreement can be an unfortunate distraction from the gospel. Meaning when you're arguing over which side of the stage the piano should be on, you're not sharing the gospel, right? And maybe you're arguing over something that is critically important to the gospel, important theological issues, but either way, whether it's important or unimportant, we know we're not sharing a gospel, right? And so it, it, we have to recognize that there are times when we should not be fighting because we should be out and accomplishing the mission that Jesus has sent us on. I shared this story, at least in part, a while back, I think right after I came. So I'll, you know, maybe some of you haven't heard it before, but I was at the church in Louisiana, and our stage looked very much similar to this one. We had the baptistry in the middle and a projector screen on the left and a projector screen on the right. And we had a certain sermon series where we had a graphic that we thought needed to be as big as possible. And so we made a new projector screen in the middle covering the baptistry and we projected it as large as possible on that projector screen. Well, um, the church lost its mind. Well, not the whole church, Certain people lost their minds in the church because that new projector screen covered up stained glass. Stained glass that had been there since the church had been built in 1642. No, in, ni- in 1980, okay? Um, and to them, this was unimaginable. And we were getting comments and having conversations where people were saying, well, either the screen goes or we go. And it was easy for us to say, well, good news, the screen was never planned on being permanent anyway. It was just for this one sermon series. But there's a bigger issue at play here, right? And so, is that a reason to leave your church? Is that a reason to be fighting and arguing? Is that a reason that we should not be out in the community sharing the gospel because we're discussing and arguing over cosmetic things within the building? Well, we're going to keep reading. We're going to find out. We're going to find a way 
to make these kinds of decisions, okay? Uh, Look now at verses 6 through 11. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. Um, We see from Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, that the apostles are the foundation of the church, meaning that it was their authority that laid the doctrinal uh, foundation of the church, meaning they had the authority to make this decision, and if only we still had their authority today, but the role of the apostle ended, and so today we are left making these decisions as best as we can off of the Bible, and then if we don't think the Bible fully addresses something, then we are in a tougher situation, right? But here we have the apostles granting the decision on this issue. Verse 7, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So this is referring back to earlier in the, gospel, or in the book of Acts, where God gives Peter a vision that he is supposed to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and, and that is the beginning of ministry outside of the Jewish context. Uh, Verse 8, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So he bore witness to them, meaning bore witness to their salvation. He, by giving them the Holy Spirit, demonstrated that they are saved in the same way as a Jewish background Christian. If it's the same Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, it's the same salvation for that person. Verse 9, He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So he's saying, obviously, they have the same salvation, even without having been circumcised, even without having followed the the Old Testament laws. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? In other words, we needed the gospel Because we couldn't follow the law. So why are we trying to put that law on them as well? Verse 11. But we believe that they will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as we will. And so Peter stands up and he clarifies and he makes it very simple. Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Whether it's Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus this law, or Jesus plus anything. Anything else, it's not the gospel. And so the apostles, Peter here, makes an important clarification. And through this argument, through this dissension, the gospel has now become that much more clear. To these genuine believers who were confused, and now they don't have a reason to be confused anymore, to these new Gentile believers who were concerned and probably very early in their faith, and now the gospel has become clear. And so sometimes church disagreement can be an unfortunate distraction from the gospel, but sometimes church disagreement can be a necessary defense of the gospel. A necessary defense of the gospel. Meaning there are times when we need to contend for the faith. There are times when there are things that are taught that are contrary to the Bible, that are contrary to the gospel, and we don't just say, oh, well, remember Philippians 2 I need to consider others as more significant than myself. I need to be humble. Yes, we need to do those things. But we also need to contend for the gospel. We need to defend uh, the, the, what the Bible says about the gospel. At another church that I served at, <clears throat> I had a particular member. Um, let's just call him Ron, because that was his name. Um, <laughs> And about once a month, he would write me a really long letter, just laying into me, accusing me of preaching legalism, accusing me of uh, preaching salvation by works, accusing me of being a, a Judaizer. And essentially, he believed a version of the gospel that I think, I believe, was fundamentally incompatible with the Bible. He believed that the word obedience was a bad word, meaning you should not call Christians to be obedient. 
which would be a struggle since for the, this year our theme has been simple obedience, right? He believed that we should never identify sin from the pulpit or in any kind of conversation because we're not God. We can't identify sin. He argued that to be a Christian was just to believe in Jesus, and that is simply it. Well, the way that he came to this conclusion was because he also had a very different view of the Bible than me. He believed that he could just pick and choose the parts of the Bible that he liked and throw away the rest of it. And if you do that, it's pretty easy to come up with whatever kind of system of belief that you want. I'm going to use a whole lot of theological terms in this sermon this morning. The term for what Ron argued for is called easy, uh, easy believism. Easy believism, meaning as long as you believe in Jesus in some way, nothing else matters, you're going to be saved. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call this cheap grace. And in order to have this view of the gospel, you have to throw away much of the Bible. Now, what we believe in is what can be described as lordship salvation, and is what we have talked about over and over through the gospel of Mark. Jesus did not come up to Levi, the tax collector, in his tax booth and say, just believe in me in some way, somehow. He came and he said, follow me. And did Levi stay in the tax booth or did he leave the tax booth? Why? Because of what he believed about Jesus. So yes, we are saved by grace through faith, but what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? What kind of faith? It means you're willing to leave behind the tax booth. And so, because Ron was defending or believing in a doctrine, a view of the Bible that was contradictory to the gospel and contradictory to the church, I did everything I could as the pastor to minimize his doctrinal influence over the church. I believe that he was creating a type of Christian that will be surprised when they appear before Jesus, before God, for judgment. Described in Matthew 7, many will say to me on that day, well, Lord, Lord, did we not? And Jesus say, depart from me, I don't know you. And I didn't want the people in my church, the people that I love, that I called family, to be surprised when they came before Jesus. And so, in that instance, every letter I responded to. We had many, many conversations over at lunch, over coffee, over text, over the phone, where I tried to show him from the Bible why what he believed was not just not true, but it was dangerous for the people that he loved. In that instance, I would have much preferred to spend my time sharing the gospel in the community. But I knew that as a pastor, I needed to protect the doctrinal fidelity of the church that I was in charge of. And so I believe that fight was worth it. Um, maybe not a fight I wanted to have, but it was important. So we're beginning to see, as we kind of work our way through this text, that sometimes it's worth it, sometimes it's not. How do we know? Well, let's finish up the text and then we'll, we'll take a look at that handout that I gave you. Verse 12. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Meaning this is just further proof that the gospel is the gospel. It's not Jesus plus anything. After they had finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related to God for how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. So he's, here he's going to quote Amos chapter 9 and Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 16. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. In other words, what um, they're standing up and saying is, well, the Bible actually confirms 
what we have seen here today, what we have decided, which is a good sign. As you're trying to make decisions on what you should do, what your church should do, if the Bible says it, well, then that's pretty clear proof. And so here, uh, it's James is standing up and saying, yes, this decision is good. It is right. It aligns with scriptural authority. In other words, if you're trying to decide, you say, hey, this person claims that what they're doing or what they're teaching is from the Holy Spirit. The best test that you have is to say, does it align with the Bible? Because the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible is not going to work and do things that is in contradiction to the book that he inspired. And that's what James demonstrates here for us. Verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. Okay, so here, this list of four things are not primarily moral instructions. They are things that are requiring ritual purity. In other words, these Jewish background Christians tell the Gentiles, these are the things that you need to do so that we can remain in fellowship with each other. Meaning, you don't have to follow all the laws of Moses, but we are. These Jewish background Christians felt Convicted that they should continue to follow Jewish rituals and purity rituals. And here's the thing about that. Is you, and according to the Jewish ritual mindset, you are contaminated by the people that you come into contact with. The people that you have a meal with. The people that you hug. And so they're saying, if we are going to be in one fellowship together, we need you to do these four things so that we can be in fellowship and you're not going, your convictions are not going to compromise our convictions and our comp- convictions are not going to compromise your convictions. We need to do these things so we can remain in fellowship together. Um, verse 21. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So remember, at this point, the Old Testament is the church's only scripture. I mean, Scripture is being developed as they are speaking, right? And so they look to the Old Testament for guidance. And so the James here is saying there's no concern that they won't understand their moral obligation when they commit to following Jesus because the moral obligation of following Jesus is very clear from the Old Testament. They also won't be surprised that we are asking these four things of them because they are based on Leviticus 17 and 18, which were the rules for resident aliens, Gentiles who lived in Israel. And they said, hey, you don't have to be one of us, but you got to do these four things so that you're not compromising our convictions. And so these four requests are perfectly parallel to what is described in Leviticus 17 and 18. And so for that reason, they won't be surprised that we are asking this of them. Verse 22, let's see how this goes over with the Gentile believers. Then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Bersabbas. I don't know why the name Judas all of a sudden has a steep decline in popularity. Just call me Bersabbas, all right? So they sent Bersabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Meaning, We don't want you to be unsettled. We want the gospel to be perfectly clear to you, but we also want you to know how you can remain in fellowship with us. So these men have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. 
If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, verse 31, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. The gospel had been clarified, their ability to remain in fellowship had been presented, and then what we see in the next passage, interestingly, after a little disagreement, Paul and Barnabas get back to work back to planting churches and sharing the gospel. And so the last thing that we would take away from this text is this, that church unity is a joyful asset to the gospel. Church unity is a joyful asset to the gospel. Churches that are in unity are able to set their minds and their focus on sending out missionaries. They're able to set their focus on sharing the gospel because they're not arguing and disagreeing, but they're also doing it with a sense of joy. We saw that in verse 31. They rejoiced because of this encouragement. We don't have to spend our time arguing endlessly in debate. We can be in unity. We can be in one accord. All right. So here's, here's the thing that we would take away from this. And even this <clears throat> sheet that I have for you, I'm going to put it on the screen if you didn't get a sheet. But each of these things is related to church unity. And that's what we need to understand. And Emily, I'm going to talk about that for a long time, so you can just leave it up there, okay? Um, All of these principles help us to work towards church unity, to know when we shouldn't be fighting or when we should be fighting. And why is that important? Because our unity has a direct effect over our ability to share the gospel. John 13, 35 says this, By this, all people, this is Jesus speaking, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Meaning, when outsiders look into a church and all they see is fighting, what would compel them to believe the gospel? But if they see a family that is united and loving each other, humbly submitting to each other, counting others as more significant themselves, this has an incredible asset to the gospel. And so, how do we know when to fight? What I have for you here, which I believe is demonstrated in this text, is a system for categorizing beliefs. It provides a hierarchy, meaning not everything you believe is as important as everything else you believe. Some things you believe, I'm not saying they're unimportant, but they are less important than other things. And so how do we categorize those? How do we understand where they fall? If we understand that, it's going to help us to know when to fight and when not to fight. When this is a necessary conversation for the defense of the gospel, or when this is just an unfortunate distraction. So, we have a pyramid, and the bottom of the pyramid are what we would call foundational beliefs. And um, this would be things that pertain to the gospel. Okay, These are the beliefs that all Christians agree on, no matter what church you go to. These are the things we all have in agreement. Um, And a a great way to determine that is is to ask the question that James asked in this text, what does the Bible say, right? But ultimately, we see the church wrestling with these issues, and we see the result in verse 11. He said, we believe that they will be saved through the grace of Lord Jesus. Meaning, no, they do not have to be circumcised. That is not a foundational belief, The gospel is the foundation, and that is what we must agree on if we are able to call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Secondly, we have doctrinal convictions. I'm going to go back through. First, I want to show you where this is in the text, and then I'm going to go back through it again and give you some more examples, okay? So, uh, secondly, we have doctrinal convictions. These are the beliefs that a church agrees on. Meaning, it's pretty obvious not every church agrees on everything, right? We can walk down the road and find a a church that agrees with us on foundational beliefs, but they might have a difference of opinion on the proper mode of baptism. Is it sprinkling or is it immersion, right? So, we see this in verse 20 of this text, 
that the, um, the Jewish background believers asked the Gentiles, hey, if we're going to stay in fellowship, if we're going to be one church, these are the things that we need to agree on. We need you to be able to do these things so that we can stay in one fellowship. These are things that we cannot compromise. If you're going to be part of our church, you got to get on board with these things, right? Then we have, in the top category, the least important things, personal preferences, right? This list of four things that the Jewish believers ask the Gentile believers to do is a very short list compared to all that the Old Testament says, all that the Jewish believers were planning on doing, including the issue of circumcision, right? They did not say, in order to be in the church with us, in order to be in fellowship with us, you have to be circumcised, or you have to follow this law, and this law, and this law, and this law. In other words, they said, for us, we recognize we can agree to disagree on those issues. It's important to us, but it does not have to be important to you. It is a personal decision, all right? Another way to think of these beliefs is they uh, go from increasing clarity in Scripture to decreasing clarity in Scripture, meaning there's a whole lot of Bible verses that very clearly explain the gospel. And then when we get to personal preferences, there are either maybe no verses or very few verses or verses that are difficult to understand. Okay? So now, let's walk back through this, and I'm going to give you some examples of each category, and this is where it gets really fun. Because not everybody agrees on what belief should be in one category. I might be about to say that a belief that you hold very near and dear is just a personal preference and we can agree to disagree on it. And if you don't agree with me on that, if you think it should be a doctrinal conviction, well, I'm not trying to run anybody off, but doctrinal convictions are the things that the church must agree on together. So you either need to work through that or you need to find a church that is in agreement with you. Again, not trying to run anybody off, but practically that's how it has to work. That's how it has to function, okay? So let's work our way through this again. Foundational beliefs, the things that all Christians agree on, what falls into that category? Well, it is the gospel, right? That we are saved by grace through faith, that Jesus willingly died on the cross. He lived a perfect and sinless life in order to then take the full wrath of God upon himself to become our substitute, to atone for our sins. He was raised from the dead to give us victory over sin and victory over death. And we eagerly await on his return to give us final victory over all evil. Okay? There's more that goes into that, but the other things are beliefs that would compromise the gospel. Meaning the gospel doesn't work unless you also believe this. Meaning historically there have been Lots of offshoots from Christianity where people did not believe in the full divinity of Jesus. And we would say that those people are not Christians. Not trying to be ugly or stingy or whatever, but if you do not believe in the full divinity of Jesus, you have compromised the gospel. Because unless Jesus is fully God, then his substitute, his atonement, does not accomplish salvation for all of mankind. Similarly, there have been plenty of offshoots from Christianity that have denied the humanity of Jesus. Well, here's the thing. If Jesus is not fully human, he cannot be our representative. He cannot be the new Adam. And so if you don't believe either of those things, you have compromised the gospel. You've broken one of its main gears, and it does not work anymore. You could put other things in this category. Uh, the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are three persons, and yet they are one God. So, for people who, here's where it gets a little tricky, is there are plenty of people who claim the name of Christian, but they don't believe all of the same foundational beliefs. And this is where we typically would use the word cult to describe those offshoots of Christianity. And the word cult has kind of changed meaning through the years. Today we hear cult and we think of like a charismatic personality who uses his authority to abuse people and make them do crazy things. That's not what the word cult used to mean. The word cult comes from a Latin word. It's the same root of cultivate or culture, meaning it is a subset. It is a spinoff. 
And in this instance, when we're talking about these other faiths, we're talking about it as a spinoff because of heretical beliefs, meaning the church has historically looked at what they believed and said, I I know you claim the name Christian, but you don't believe the same foundational beliefs. Whether you claim the name Christian or not, you're not Christian because what you believe compromises the gospel. And this still happens today. Again, not trying to be mean or make people uncomfortable, but this is true of Mormonism or or what they call themselves the Latter-day Saints. In Mormonism, though they claim the name Christian, they believe that God is not spirit. God the Father is not spirit. He's a physical person. They believe that Jesus is not God, and they believe that man, if he's good enough in this life, can become a God in heaven. And so we go, yeah, I see you claim, it's confusing, you claim the name Jesus, you say Jesus is your Lord, You use a lot of the same terminology we use, but if we look at your beliefs, they're clearly in contradiction to our fundamental beliefs, and they also compromise the gospel. The same is true of Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is divine. They don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. They believe he's an active force, and they don't believe in hell. And I've just given you a short list for both of these faith traditions. It's a much longer list of things that they believe that are contrary to what we believe. But don't you see how each of these beliefs compromises the gospel? They claim the name Christian, but they do not believe what Jesus proclaimed. They don't believe the gospel that Jesus died for. And so they claim the name untruthfully. And so those are our foundational beliefs. Whatever church you go to, If they're a true Christian church, they believe these things. Secondly, we have doctrinal convictions. These are the things, the beliefs that that a church agrees on. Um, And these issues, these beliefs, tend to be functional in nature. Meaning, it, it changes how the church operates. And for that reason, you cannot hold opposite opinions on the issue. I'll give you an example. We are Emmanuel Baptist Church, and we believe in uh, believer's baptism, which is baptism after your salvation by immersion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as a demonstration of your uh, recognition of Jesus as Lord. That's the definition of believer's baptism. We also use believer's baptism as a prerequisite for membership in our church. And so, There are plenty of churches that are good, conservative, evangelical churches that have a different opinion on baptism. But you see how we could not be the same fellowship because that decision is very functional in nature. Are you a member or aren't you a member? You can't be in the middle. It's yes or no. Have you been baptized via immersion or not? And so that puts us in a position where we go, ah, you know, no hard, well, Historically, there have been hard feelings, but ideally you would say no hard feelings, but we necessarily must separate fellowship because this issue is something we believe strongly. We can't compromise on it, and it it changes. It affects how the church functions. So um, some other examples in that category would be the Lord's Supper. Some churches practice closed communion, meaning only members are allowed to participate in communion, and then we practice open communion, meaning any Christian who is present can participate in the Lord's Supper. But you go, again, no hard feelings. I understand the rationale, but we can't do both. It's one or the other. It necessarily requires us to separate fellowship. Um, Another example would be the church's view on practicing of tongues. You're either going to practice tongues in your service or you're not. You can't have both opinions. It's functional in nature. And here at EBC, we do not practice tongues in our worship services. And so I think back to uh, Ron's letters, and we argued over a lot of different theological beliefs, but in the end, it always came back to the Bible. Because I would say, well, the reason I believe this is because the Bible says this. And he would essentially say, He wouldn't use these words, but he essentially would say, but I don't like that verse. I don't choose to believe that verse. And so all of our disagreement ultimately funneled back down to one issue, which is that I have a very high view of Scripture. I believe it is 
authoritative. It is inerrant. It is the word of God. It is inspired. It, it is our guide. You know, and he did not believe that about the Bible. And so this forced us to have a whole lot of disagreement. But here's the thing. Not all Christians have a high view of Scripture. But here at EBC, we do. We believe all those things to be what the Bible says about itself, that it is breathed out by God. We believe that to be true. And so we are going to do the things that the Bible tells us to do. And if you don't have that opinion of the Bible, well, we are probably going to have to separate fellowship because there's going to come along some decision that we make at some point that is based off of what we think is a clear command from God's word. And you're going, yeah, but I don't like that verse, you know, or something like that. All right. So now personal preferences, and this is the most exciting one, okay? This would be the beliefs we can agree to disagree on. These, this is essentially everything else that is not the gospel or is not functional for the church, okay? And so I want to go back to first the stained glass that got covered up, right? Apparently, there's some people in the church who had a very strong belief that the church was supposed to have that stained glass in view. I've been in a church where we were doing a worship center renovation, and it would have been $30,000 cheaper to buy chairs instead of renovating our pews. And I had a lot of comments of, it's just not church unless there are pews. So you see, this is a belief that someone holds, and they feel very strongly about it, but we have to ask the question, does it compromise the gospel? Does it change the function of the church? And based off of this biblical paradigm, we would look at stained glass and we go, no, clearly that's a personal preference. It's something that you like. But here's the thing. I genuinely believe that church membership is a calling from God. You shouldn't just be here because we're the closest church to your house. You shouldn't just be here because you like the music or you like the renovation that we just accomplished. You should be here because God has called you to be a member of this church. And if that is true, if church membership is a calling from God, then clearly it's not based on cosmetics or style, which means the color of the back wall can change and you don't have to like it for this still to be the place that God has called you to be. And you go, I don't like it, but it's a personal preference. I can humbly submit to others as more significant than myself on this issue. Now, it gets a little bit more difficult. There's stained glass in view. There are some thought a, thought a lot about Calvinism, difference of opinion on salvation as it, per- salvation as it pertains. And the theological positions do not compromise the gospel, and they do not change the full. And a bit of new thing on periods of periods of God's God's work that are different from each other. Okay, but the same is true of this issue: biblical covenantalists and biblical dispensationalists. They they neither of them compromise how the gospel functions, and neither of them change how the church functions. Which means we can have good conversations, but we can agree to disagree. This is true of continuationism and cessationism. So many isms, right? So this is your view on the charismatic gifts. Do they continue to today or did they cease at a certain time? Now, again, this is where we might get into some functional issues. If you're a hardcore continuationist, you would say tongues must be practiced in our church. And we don't do that. So you go, okay, that's a functional issue. So depending on your view, this might fall in tier two, a doctrinal conviction. We might need to separate fellowship over this. But depending on your ability to be flexible, probably we can put this into the top tier category. And uh, neither of us are hardcore on either ends of this spectrum, but we are on different sides of the spectrum. I'm more of a cessationist, and he's more of a continuationist, and it does not cause problems in our daily work routine, okay? We're not fighting, we're not standing at the printer fighting over this issue, okay? It's not a problem because it's a personal preference. It should not cause us to separate fellowship. 
All right. Uh, here, let's keep going. Let's just keep making people mad. <clears throat> some, of the, some of these need a little bit of a caveat, okay? Young earth versus old earth. Is the earth 6,000 years old or 600 billion years old, right? Depending on how you arrived at your position of old earth, this might be something we can agree to disagree on, okay? If you believe the earth is 6,000 or 600 billion years old because you doubt the authority of God's word, then that's an issue. We already said this. The, the authority of God's word is foundational for our church. But if you have a high view of scripture and you're able to arrive at an old earth while maintaining a high view of scripture, we are able to agree to disagree on this issue. Because it's not going to compromise the gospel, and it's not going to change how our church functions. Right? Last one, last example. Your view on the millennium. Are you premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, or whatever else there is? Is it compromising the gospel? Does it change what it means to be saved? Is it changing how our ch- church functions? Will our business meetings be different? Will we share the gospel differently? Will we have potlucks differently because of when Jesus is returning? No. So you can hold your opinion on this very strongly, but it should not cause us to separate fellowship. This is something we can agree to disagree on. So <clears throat> that's a lot all at once, but I want to remind us what the passage that we reflected over first thing this morning, which we can humbly consider as others as more significant than ourselves, looking to Jesus as our perfect example of what it means to do that. We can hold these personal preferences very strongly, and yet we should not be disunity. And so if we're having conversations about these issues in a way that causes disunity, the problem is with us and our pride and our lack of humility. That being said, there are times when we absolutely need to defend and protect the fidelity of the gospel. There are times when we hear someone's belief and say, I'm sorry, that compromises the gospel. That doesn't work. And that is a good conversation to have because that person might learn and understand the gospel more clearly through that conversation. In all of these things, we seek to be humble and loving so that our church can remain unified, so that we can remain effective for the great commission that Jesus has sent us on. We're going to respond to this text by singing a song titled Fade Away, in which we're going to sing this, this, these verses. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. Let all else fade away. Take this whole world and give me Jesus. Let all else fade away. Not my will, but yours alone forever. So let's sing this song based off of what we just learned right? There are things that Jesus is in that we are going to hold on to until we see him face to face. But there are some things, like maybe where the piano is, that we can let those things fade away. Father, we love you and we're thankful for this wisdom that you've given us, this guidance that you've provided for us through your perfect and holy word. We ask that you would help us to be humble. You would help us to submit to one another. You would help us to focus on the main things, to be passionate about the main things and let the minor things be minor.